OK, 15 minutes past eight and the Six Nations is hurtling towards us. We know the makeup of the Ireland squad at this stage and I suppose one of the most interesting talking points is always going to be the 9-10 axis and we're focusing on the nines today with Tomás O'Leary, of course, a Grand Slam winning uh, scrum half himself. Tomás, good morning to you. How are you? Hey, Jerry, how's the farm? Yeah, All good, boy. We're, we're, we, before we get into the, the depth chart, um, uh, Joseph on our team was talking about this this morning and the relationship between the nine and the ten and how they actually need each other to impress as a as a collective. And sometimes the, the 10 plays well, sometimes the 9 plays well, but it's hard for either of them to play well if they're not playing well as a, as a tandem. How important is that relationship? Yeah, it's, it's very important. Um, I suppose from, from a 10's point of view, it's probably more important for him because he's the one obviously getting the service. He's the one, I suppose being dictated to by the nine. The nine is his hands on the ball. He makes most decisions in a game. Uh, you could argue maybe that the, the tens decisions might be a bit more important, but uh, every every rock the nine gets that he is a, a decision, you know, whether he's hitting maybe a forward, maybe he's hitting the, the, the ten out the back, or maybe whether he's going to kick the ball, all right? So um, the nine makes more decisions, but it's important from his point of view then that the, the ten is very clear in his instruction and, and demanding as well, because if you have a, a quite ten outside you, um, that get, makes probably you a little bit, uh, I suppose, less, um, uh, less, I suppose, more indecisive as a nine. Um, so whereas if you have a ten barking at you, saying, "Oh, you know, hit up the forwards there, um, hit, hit the second man, or hit me out the back, or, or flash it to me straight away," then it takes the decisions out of your out of your head. So having a very decisive ten outside you is very important. So, um, but I think more so for the for the ten. You know, having a having a nine who will be compliant and give you exactly what you want, I think that's important. But from a nine's point of view, then I think probably the pack in front of you and the ball you're getting. So, um, you know, obviously if your pack is on top, whether that be at scrum time or mall time, uh, you're getting an arm to a ride, then you can give as you know as good service um, to the ten as possible. You, you know, you're on the front foot. Same with the rock ball. You know, you hear Irish teams in particular, not all teams, talk about the breakdown, how important that is. And I know Paul O'Connell obviously has had a massive influence on, on that area with Ireland recently. So if your breakdown is slow, then you're obviously shoveling on some pretty poor ball to your team and he's going to not be able to, to, to pull the strings then and dictate the tempo of the game uh, beyond the front foot. So um, I think the relationship between 9 and 10 is really, really important. But you have those other factors like um, the rock ball that you're getting and maybe if your pack is, is struggling as well, that's going to really affect it. Uh, do you feel like experience and having a balance in the experience between the 9 and 10 is actually hugely important at this level or is it more about the two styles being simpatico it doesn't really matter if, if uh, you know, you've know you got a 100 caps in Sexton and Craig Casey with hardly any caps because the style is simpatico but it might not actually make that much sense to have Conor Murray and Carty for example it might be better to have Casey and Carty irrespective of the fact that they don't have any time playing together or they don't have between them 150 caps that actually their styles also work together. Yeah, I do think combinations come into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like, if if it's a case of which Ireland seem to be moving towards, um, you know, a really up up tempo, um, high tempo game, um, and obviously Gibson Park, I suppose, is is the man man with the with the nine jersey at the moment, and his ability to I suppose get the breakdown quickly and move the ball quickly. Um, so then, I suppose, that's why Craig Casey is probably in the squad as well, because he has similar attributes in terms of moving the ball. You know, he, he gets the break done quickly and he flashes the ball. So, um, and, and that's going to, I suppose, create the, the tempo and the game plan that that uh, that this current Irish uh, management are, are really pushing for. But I do think then, um, and I suppose the why Murray then, where he fits into that, um, I think you have to have the ability to change a game plan and, you know, the experience that he has. Um, look, he can play that up, up-tempo game plan at times. He's been criticised for not doing it, but he certainly can play that. We've seen him, you know, numerous times throughout his career, maybe not more recently, but he can play that game plan. But, you know, you have to be able to adapt to maybe conditions if conditions don't allow and, 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 and dictate that you have to play a slower tempo. Um, and obviously we know about his game management skills so if, if a Sexton or whoever went off at 10 and you're bringing on a, a less experienced um, out-half option, then Murray can dictate the options and you can bring him off the bench 
or like I said, if it's a, I suppose, our more abrasive game uh, dictated by the weather, then the likes of Conor Murray would add value and be able to manage a game. So, um, yeah, I think those combinations are important. Um, but look, I, I think you, you have to pick each position on its own uh, entity as well. So, um, just because you're changing the the ten doesn't mean you should probably rip up the game plan and, and change the the nine as well. So, at stages you might uh, be dictated to in terms of weather, how a game is going, but I don't think you should be dictated to in terms of combinations. That's my own feeling anyway. That ability to recognise how to dictate a game as a number nine, how long does that take to actually develop and to become an expert on it? Because obviously Conor Murray's got a wealth of experience to be able to do it, but do you look at the other scrum halves around the squad and say no problem, or do all of them possibly need more experience to get to the way Conor Murray looks at the game? Yeah, one good question. Um, I think you have a natural feel for a game um, and have an ability then to, I suppose, pick the right option. It, you know, it comes with experience. Um, and that, it doesn't mean you have to be playing with Ireland to get that experience. You know, you can get that experience playing against Connacht in the sports ground in the, in the Pro 14. Um, and I suppose that's the, the only question mark I'd have um, over Greg Casey at the moment. Um, like I said, he's got all the, the skills and the, the, the raw attributes to be an international nine, he showed that. Um, but I suppose, in, you know, the only question mark is, you know, when it is uh, a really, uh, I suppose, a, a slow abrasive game, whereby it becomes more tactical. And, and we even saw that in the in, in the Pro 14, um, you know, even against Connacht, um, with himself and who was at 10 with him. Um, Healy or Crowley? Um, I, I forget, no, maybe, yeah, it was, it was or was it... Joe was a Carberry, Joey Carberry, oh, maybe. Okay. I think, in, yeah, yeah. Um, Pre-injury. Yeah. So it was, it was a pretty abrasive game. It wasn't a flat, fast, flowing, free tempo game, and it was uh, really around game management. And just a few of his decisions maybe uh, showed that inexperience about uh, managing a game in those tight conditions, whereby it wasn't flowing, it wasn't really high tempo game. So I think he'll have learned a lot from that experience. So again, next time he he maybe faces those conditions. He'll have looked at the game, he'll have analysed the game, he'll have talked to the coaches uh, and he'll really appreciate the, the value maybe in maybe thinking the ball in behind or, or whatever. So again, he's going to get that and it doesn't mean that he has to play 10 caps for Ireland to get that. But I think he'll pick that up in, in, in the league, he'll pick that up in the Heineken Cup games when he's coming on. So um, look, hopefully he'll he'll get a start in a, in a couple of the big Heineken Cup games at some stage. Um, I think that will also help him, you know, in a real high pressure environment whereby each, de- each decision he makes is going to be, I suppose, vital to to the victory or, you know, obviously it will, if he makes a couple of rock decisions, then it might end up in defeat. But there are the lessons you're going to learn as a, as a halfback. Um, and look, I suppose the games that he has played, you know, the, the Heineken Cup or the, the Champions Cup hasn't really kicked off yet. And that's probably... I suppose it's no it's no fault of the, of the competition. It's just the way it's it's uh, it, it's played it out itself out with with COVID and with the groups and the kind of mismatches that have have uh, have, have happened. So hopefully, you know, once we get into the into the next round, it looks like it's going to really kick off. And, and I think that experience as well for him, as well as the I suppose his his potential to, to play with Ireland in the next next few weeks as well will will add him some valuable experience. But I think, you know, from growing up playing schools rugby, playing club rugby, rugby and then the introduction out to professional rugby, I think he's learning pretty quickly. Let's let's get to the depth chart then. So um who is who who's number one on your list? I think Gibson Park has to be um purely based on his his recent performances in Jerry Shirt. Um you know even the the game against Japan. Um, I know Japan were criticised after, but it's it just going to, you know, we now know that that Japanese team are still very, very competitive. Um, and, and that Ireland first half performance, um, Ireland rip, ripped them apart. And it kind of was maybe a, an introduction to, the, you know, how Andy Farrell wants his team to play. And I think Gibson Park was really at the, at the centre of that. He was the fulcrum of that performance. And, you know, like I said, his work getting to the breakdown quickly and whipping the ball away. But he had a few little nice subtleties to add there. I remember he had a little uh, a dink through to I think it was for Conway to finish in the in the right corner. Um so he just showed that he he was a natural footballing nine. Uh, and then obviously then backing that up, uh, you know, playing playing against uh playing against his, his native native country um and, and and guiding Ireland to to another fantastic performance against them. So 
I think he's he's at the moment he's he's the man with the with the nine jersey and until um, either someone behind him has an unbelievable uh, I suppose uh, vein of form or as his form dips I think he's he's the number nine at the moment for Ireland and I think deservedly so. He's going to turn thirty next month and. Uh, you, you kind of uh, there's no perfect age for any sports person because it depends on injuries and it depends on experience. He's he's relatively inexperienced as an international. This is uh, twelve caps into his his Ireland career at this stage, but uh, it's it's a bit of a sweet spot, I suspect, for somebody who you reach full understanding of your athletic requirements. You also understand what the vagaries of the professional game are going to be like, but yeah. that knowledge of having played hundreds and hundreds of games and getting the starts that he is getting at the moment is is around 30 but it, it should be the peak he's kind of he's, he's in his sweet spot at the moment yeah I think so look he's look athletically um, you know he looks he looks he looks very very sharp just in terms of fitness levels but um, you watch him when when Ireland make a line break and his ability to to get upfield uh, very very quickly look his speed looks to be up there with the best of them so um, yeah look in terms of that and like you said then in terms of his his rugby intellect and his rugby experience. Um, I guess, look, I don't know how many games he played in, in New Zealand, but we all know about the exposure to, to the best players in the world. And you talk to any any coach or any, any player coming from there, um, I suppose having that, uh, you know, uh, experience of playing against some of the best players in the world and playing with them. Um, so that, I suppose, that different tactical maybe uh, appreciation and uh, maybe influence as well. So that, that, that'll that bear fruit and that'll be a positive, uh, you know, influence on the Leinster group and the Irish group in particular. So, yeah, I think just because just he's only got 12 caps with Ireland, um, like I said, that doesn't mean he's not an experienced nine. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, he can't bring all his experience to the party so far when he's played with Ireland. Uh, and I know this will probably be his first major uh, Six Nations campaign as 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 the as 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 a top dog, but um, I think based on the way that Ireland are trying to play, uh, based on the what we're trying to bring to the the game plan, I think he's the, he's the man uh, best suited to to carry that out plan for um, for Andy Farrell. Because of the change in the style of play, and because of I guess the attachment with Conor Murray to the success under Joe Schmidt. Do you think there'll be more questions about who actually is the second choice to, to Gibson Park if, if things do pr- progress this way? Do you think that Conor Murray will essentially be, I guess, uh, attached to the, to the regime that is no longer in charge and the, the style of play that is no longer the style of play for Ireland? Yeah, look, fortunately for Conor, there's going to be question marks over you know his selection for the rest of his career by the looks of it. Um, look, he's got 92 caps for Ireland and we all know his experience with the Lions as well and, and Munster. Um, and I suppose when somebody is around for so long anyway um, I think familiarity might breed a bit of contempt as well from from a fan's point of view from a media's point of view um, so he'll always have question marks to answer and I suppose his his style as well is probably a bit more uh, relaxed or, or you know um, natural than than the likes of Gibson Park or Clay Casey or even Luke McGrath those guys um, competing for the position um, he's 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 just you know he's a longer stride than them. He's taller player than them, so it might look like he's not maybe getting to the breakdown as quickly. But if you talk to any ten who's played outside him, um, none of them have any issue with his delivery. In fact, they they all love his delivery. You know the the speed of his pass, the where he puts the ball on the money majority of the time. I guess the the issue and the the, the main complaint over over Murray, obviously over the last couple of years, has been his tendency to I suppose go to the air in terms of you know box kicking, putting putting ball to foot too much. Um, and from my from my point of view, looking from the outside, um, yeah, look, I think that's probably would assume that's more to do with a, a tactical approach from the team um, and him carrying out those orders. Um, rather than him, his natural game. Look, he is a fantastic box kicker. When he's on the money, he's the best box kicker in the world. So, you know, he, he has to use that strength at, at, at a certain amount of times in a game. But um, I think particularly with, with this Irish setup, I think it's going to be less tendency to slow the ball down and go to the air and more of an emphasis on, you know, getting quick rock ball and continuing to play a tempo. And I think he's he, he is capable of still doing that, um, and he can use that ability to to put the ball on, on the money in front of his ten because his pass is spot on when he when he's flowing. Okay, so I think he's still very very capable and still very very deserving of being in the Six Nations panel, and I think he's still probably number two in my book. Um, like I said, he can bring that experience to the to the party, 
another aspect of his game that's very much underestimated is his defensive uh, capability and his defensive responsibility with the team. So, um, and you know, come Six Nations time and, and come World Cup time down the line, maybe you won't get that fast tempo game at times. Maybe it'll be more of an abrasive game whereby, whether it's a France or whether it's a, a South Africa or whoever yeah. it is, that the game is slowed down or the game is on a knife edge and you want your most physical uh, nine on the park um, to, to basically front up. Um, so I think that's probably underestimated too. We're, we're all focused on attack and I think we probably should be because in order to, to get to where we want to get as a, as a country and in, in a World Cup in particular, our attack needs to be more varied, our attack needs to be more dangerous. So yeah, I think we should focus on that. I think Murray can contribute to that, but I do think other aspects of his game are probably underestimated because he's delivered for so long. Yeah, I, I just Let's talk about the box kicking for a second. Is he a victim of his own success in some ways in that you said there, he, when he's on the money, he's the best box kicker in the world. So Joe Schmidt would have looked at that and gone, with the way the rules are at the moment, that gives us a relatively good opportunity to maintain possession and also is an important attacking threat for us. So it, the, the coach dictates that we're going to be this heavy aerial team, physically abrasive. That's one of our strengths and we'll be very strong from the set piece and that's how we're going to win games. And did Johan van Graan look at that and decide, well, that suits me too. So that actually when he plays for Munster, under van Graan, he's been told to do something similar to what he was told to do for Ireland. When actually, who knows what because he's never told us, who knows what his own innate game actually is? Yeah, no, I think he's 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 definitely, as you said, a victim of that. Look, he's, he still has the choice to make every time he, you know, he, he comes to a rock, you know, he he's really in charge of that. So, and look, he's got 92 caps for his country. So I suppose it's probably would be a bit naive of, of me and yourselves to think that he's handcuffed by this, by this regime that he has to kick every time he's, in his own half or whatever. So, and look, he doesn't kick every time he's in his own half. So, obviously, he's that's probably slightly um, exaggerated by 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 the by the conversation around him. But um, look, I do think definitely that um, you know when Razi Erasmus would have been getting Munster back on track, that his focus was definitely on Munster being competitive, and his focus was um, on Munster exiting. You, you exit your half. You don't invite pressure on. Um, so Conor Murray obviously being the best box in the world and we get our wingers chasing. So um, he definitely embraced that and then he, he encouraged teams to play once they're in their own half. So I assume uh, I, didn't, I haven't played under the current Mon Mon Munster regime, but based on what we've seen, there hasn't been any great ambition to play um, at a high tempo, any great ambition to to get the likes of, of um, you know, Pete Hurls, uh, Andrew Conway, these guys, Ebo on the ball early and give them space out wide. Unfortunately, up until this year where there's maybe uh, some signs that we're, we're trying to play in a more attacking brand in Munster, um, it has very much been, uh, you know, our wingers were, were contesting, our wingers were uh, chasing box kicks. So, um, and I think Munster have realised that they need to move away from that in order to compete, in order to be successful. I do think Murray can, is capable of that, like I said. So, yeah, I think he's definitely, I suppose, coaches have designed game plans around that strength and particularly probably the South African coaches. So maybe it's just about him uh, consciously trying to uh, move away from that and, and adapt and really focus on now the opportunity for him to, to, to really re-embrace playing rugby at a really, really high tempo, which again, I said he, he is capable of. Yeah, OK, it'll be interesting to see um, how well he adapts to the, the new um, regime in Ireland. Who's third? Is it, is it automatically Casey because he's in the squad at the moment? And is that right as far as you're concerned? Yeah, that's um, that's my probably biggest point of, I suppose, debate. Um, I'm not really sure who, who should be third. Um, I think obviously Casey at the moment he he's there, and they're probably looking at the next World Cup, which I think is a it's a good is a good way of um, I suppose preparing because um, previously we might have uh, been had the more um, I suppose reserved or, or you know conservative selection. Um, you know, Craig Casey is not that. Like I said, he's relatively inexperienced even in his professional uh, capacity. And, you know, as he he's 40 or 50 caps at Munster, if if, if he has that. Um, and like I said, um, I suppose he hasn't really, really been tested. Even the Heineken Cup games that he's played, you know, they've either been, you know, um, well, part the last game when he came on and, you know, Munster were chasing a game with, I think he came on with about eight minutes to go over and cast. 
um, and he did add a bit. Um, I was unlucky. He he dropped the ball. He could have potentially been 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 under the sticks for a, he had a lovely support line. He added a good bit of tempo, and obviously they had that control um, getting over the line to, to snatch victory. But per, this was part of that. Any of the games he's played in Europe have been, you know, uh, games that were won that he's coming off the bench or yeah. games yeah. games that were were one sided. So again. Has he has he been really tested um, when when everything's been on the line? Um, you know when it's been really really high pressure. Um, and Luke, Luke McGrath has obviously. Yeah, Luke McGrath has, um, and I'm a big uh, you know admirer of Luke McGrath. You know he was uh, I think Leinster Player of the Year back in '17 or '18. He's a Heineken Cup winner. Cap- he's captain Leinster numerous times. He's five or six. I don't know how many titles Leinster have in the in the Pro 14, but. He's obviously got, um, a, you know, a lot of respect within that Leinster dressing room in particular, but a um, good, good bit of experience with Ireland as well. So I think, look, you, you see, the, again, how Leinster are playing, I know, uh, against Bath the last day, it was a, another mismatch, so you can't judge too much into it. But another guy who's probably, maybe you can feel a bit, um, maybe peeved that he hasn't had more Irish caps. But again, look, you, you, you can't criticise Maybe the potential that Chris, uh, or sorry, that, that that Craig Casey has. Um, so, I think it's good to give him more experience. Good to give him more uh, exposure to the Irish camp. Um, like I think the benefit of the likes of Luke McGrath. I think we know if we call him, we know what he can do. Um, you know, he has that experience playing with Ireland. He has that experience playing with Leinster in the big games. So, I think um, we develop Craig Casey. I think it's probably the right choice. We expose him to the top class international rugby. Um, I'm assuming. I'm not not sure. That it'll be one and two. Connor Murray at, at number two. Gibson Park is is the nine. Um, but you know, Craig Casey might uh, get on the bench for for a couple of games, and I think it'd be great to get him that exposure and you know bring him on with you know thir- thirty minutes, twenty minutes to go in a Six Nations game. That's in the melting pot. So yeah, I think he has the capability of being a top class international line. So I think it's probably a good call that he's that he's third choice at the moment. Are Marmion or Doak close to um, close to Casey? Close to McGrath? What's what's? F- yeah, look, I'd probably if I was if I needed to bring in a a nine outside of those three, I'd bring in Luke McGrath straight away. But Marmion. To be fair, his form of this year has been very, very impressive. Another guy who's very unlucky and he's done nothing wrong. Um, you know, he's was involved in Grand Slam winning uh, squads and teams, and you know, came on off the bench and, and covered the wing in a few uh, few few times for Ireland as well. So, um, another guy who's just just been very unlucky. Look, it's a it's a it's a position that we're kind of uh, blessed with in terms of depth at the moment. Um, and you know, even that that game we spoke about. Um, you know, that Craig Casey might have uh, learned a few lessons from against Connacht. I think conversely, Kier Marmion probably showed his experience that day. Um, you know, so um, that's probably the value and the ability that he still has. He definitely still has the ability to play international rugby. Um, so, look, he's unlucky to be in position four or five, probably five in my book. But um, again, another guy that if you called into the 23 in the morning he'd very much do a job for you and he's a you know very very good nine and he's never let Ireland down or he's never let Connacht down so um, and his form like I said uh, since the start of the season has been very very good and again uh, Connacht um, are playing that kind of brand of rugby that's high tempo that's exciting to watch so um, himself and, and obviously Blade are very much at the forefront of that so Marmion's form has been very very good and another guy who again himself and Luke McGrath must be kind of scratching their heads saying what do they have to do but you know like I said I, t- I still think it's the right decision to have Murray and, and Craig Casey at 2 and 3 Alright Tomas we we'll leave it there good stuff thanks a million for joining us cheers Cheers boys It's a relatively rude health for Ireland when it comes to the scrum halves when the, there's a good bit of experience and title winning nowhere near the team at the moment Yeah and uh, like I mean another name you could add to the list is Quaylen Blade who looked sensational on the ball uh, on uh, on Sunday afternoon as well so I guess it's because there's only uh, one jersey on the, on the starting team you know that and they never like, get replaced really yeah true yeah um, it's not like uh, you can just sub somebody in there and I, I don't know maybe unless they, the, the new style of play for Ireland probably th- tires the nine out a little bit more maybe maybe OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with a new and improved razor 